How long would it take us to go to Mercury? The smallest planet of the solar system is a very unique planet and holds answers to a lot of questions about our solar system and its evolution. Thus, exploration of Mercury is important for a number of reasons. As the closest planet to the Sun, it is a unique celestial body that can provide valuable insights into the early history of our solar system. One of the key reasons for exploring Mercury is to learn more about its surface and atmosphere. Despite being the smallest planet in our solar system, Mercury has a unique surface that is heavily cratered and has evidence of past volcanic activity. Studying this surface can provide valuable information on the early history of our solar system and the processes that shaped it. Another reason for exploring Mercury is to study its magnetic field. Despite its small size, it has a surprisingly strong magnetic field that is similar in strength to Earth's. This magnetic field is thought to be generated by the planet's core, which is composed of molten iron. Studying this magnetic field can provide valuable insights into the structure and composition of the planet's interior. Exploring Mercury is also important for understanding its potential for hosting life. While the surface conditions on Mercury are extreme, there is evidence to suggest that the planet may have had liquid water on its surface in the past. If this is the case, it's possible that conditions on the planet may have been suitable for the emergence of life. Studying the potential for life on Mercury can provide valuable insights into the potential for life elsewhere in the universe. Overall, exploration of Mercury is important for understanding the early history of our solar system, the processes that shaped it, and the potential for life on other planets. By studying this fascinating planet, we can continue to unlock the mysteries of our universe and expand our knowledge of the cosmos. In order to continue the exploration, we need to reach the planet first. To answer the question of how long it would take us to go to Mercury, we need to consider a lot of factors like speed, distance, propulsion systems, etc. The discussions that we will make would be based upon the current level of technology that humanity possesses. The first factor to consider would be the speed at which we would be traveling. The fastest spacecraft ever launched was the Parker Solar Probe, which reached speeds of up to 430,000 kilometers per hour. However, even at this speed, it would still take us over four months to reach Mercury. And that is the case at the fastest speeds and considering Mercury is closest to us. How far is it from Earth usually? Let's talk about that first. We all know planets follow an elliptical orbit. All the planets follow their orbits and because of this type, distances between them might vary. They might be closest at a certain point of time and they might be farthest too. So there is no one distance between Earth and Mercury. Mercury's closest approach to Earth is 28.6 million miles, while its greatest distance from Earth is 43.4 million miles. Mercury's eccentric orbit causes this wide difference between the nearest and furthest distances. It has the most eccentric orbit in our solar system, with an eccentricity of 0.21. With an eccentricity of 0.06, Venus has the least eccentric orbit. There are instances when Mercury is behind the Sun, resulting in a Mercury, Sun and Earth alignment. The Sun will be in between Earth and Mercury. Mercury is now about 138 million kilometers from the Earth. The furthest it can get is 222 million kilometers. Mercury's closest approach to Earth happens when both planets are on the same side of the Sun, a phenomenon known as inferior conjunction. Mercury is now positioned between our Sun and Earth, shortening the distance between the two planets to about 28.6 million miles or 46 million kilometers. There have been several previous missions that have been sent to the first planet in our solar system. While it may take us several months to reach Mercury using current technology, there have been several previous missions that have been sent to the planet. The first mission to Mercury was the Mariner 10 spacecraft, which was launched by NASA in 1973. The Mariner 10 mission took a total of six months to reach the first planet, with the spacecraft using a gravitational slingshot with Venus to accelerate its journey. Once it reached Mercury, the spacecraft conducted several flybys of the planet, gathering data on its surface and atmosphere. Another mission to Mercury was the Messenger spacecraft, 
which was launched by NASA in 2004. This mission took a total of six and a half years to reach Mercury, with the spacecraft using multiple gravitational slingshots with Earth and Venus to accelerate its journey. Once it reached Mercury, the Messenger spacecraft entered into orbit around the planet, conducting detailed studies of its surface and atmosphere. This mission lasted for over four years before the spacecraft ran out of fuel and crashed into the planet's surface. More recently, the Bepi Colombo mission was launched by the European Space Agency and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency in 2018. This mission is currently on its way to Mercury with an expected arrival date in 2025. The spacecraft is using a combination of solar electric propulsion and gravitational slingshots with Earth, Venus, and Mercury itself to reach its destination. Overall, previous missions to Mercury have taken several months to several years to reach the planet, depending on factors like route and technology used. These missions have provided valuable information on the planet's surface and atmosphere, and have laid the groundwork for future missions to explore this challenging destination. But if you think carefully, the previous missions and the time taken in them differs drastically. Although Earth is 10 times closer to Mercury than Jupiter, missions to both planets can take roughly the same length of time to reach their scientific orbits. Why is this the case? NASA's Mariner 10 spacecraft took only 147 days to reach the innermost planet of the solar system in the 1970s. However, more recent missions, like as NASA's Messenger in the late 2000s and the European-Japanese Bepi Colombo launched in 2018, will take years to reach Mercury. The reason for this is that they are not on the same route. Messenger and Bepi Colombo were meant to enter orbit around the planet and perform more extensive scientific research over a longer period of time, whereas Mariner 10 conducted three flybys of Mercury while in orbit around the Sun, offering our first up-close glimpse of its surface. To enter orbit around Mercury, the spacecraft must move slowly enough relative to the planet's velocity to be trapped by its gravity. They must slow down from their original speed, which is rather challenging in the vacuum of space. In order to reduce the time taken by a spacecraft to reach Mercury, we can use a method called gravitational slingshot. This involves using the gravitational pull of another planet such as Earth or Venus to accelerate the spacecraft and reduce the time it takes to reach its destination. For example, if we were to use a gravitational slingshot with Earth, it would take us just over two months to reach Mercury. However, this method also has its drawbacks, as the spacecraft would need to be carefully maneuvered to avoid colliding with the planet it's using for the slingshot. Another factor to consider is the time it would take for the spacecraft to land on the surface of Mercury. Unlike Earth, Mercury has no atmosphere, which means that the spacecraft would need to use its own propulsion systems to slow down and land on the planet's surface. This could add additional time to the overall journey. Once we've landed on the surface of Mercury, we would need to consider the time it would take to conduct any scientific experiments or research on the planet. Due to the extreme temperatures on Mercury, any missions would need to be carefully planned and carried out quickly to avoid damaging the spacecraft or the equipment on board. Overall, the time it would take us to go to Mercury would depend on a variety of factors, including the speed of the spacecraft, the use of gravitational slingshots, and the time needed for landing and conducting experiments on the planet's surface. However, even with the fastest spacecraft and the most efficient route, it would still take us several months to reach Mercury and carry out any necessary research. How long would it take us to go to Venus? Venus is the brightest planet in our sky. In fact, it's just in the list of brightest objects after the Sun and the Moon. Also known as a twin of our planet Earth, exploration of Venus has been one of the most important planetary objectives after Mars. Humanity has sent many missions to the morning star, but the mysteries around the planet are still to be answered. And to answer those questions, we need to first go there. It's full of scientific marvels, such as being the hottest planet in our solar system and having 92 times the surface pressure of Earth. We have sent several unmanned expeditions to Venus, but we have yet to set foot on its surface. When considering an accomplishment like this, there are several elements to consider. 
The sun is the brightest object in our sky because it is a huge ball of fire. The moon is bright because it is incredibly close and reflects the light from the sun. But Venus is bright for two main reasons. It's highly reflective atmosphere and it's very close distance to Earth. So what is the distance of Venus from Earth? Let's talk about that first. We all know planets follow an elliptical orbit. All the planets follow their orbits and because of this type, distances between them might vary. They might be closest at a certain point of time and they might be farthest too. So there is no one distance between Earth and Venus. You will observe Venus to be on the opposite side of the Sun from us when it reaches superior conjunction. The largest distance between the two planets is when the Earth is at the extreme end of its orbital ellipse. In the same manner, they are closest to each other at the inferior conjunction, which happens every 584 days. This is the point at which Earth, Venus, and the Sun all align, with Venus and Earth on opposite sides of the Sun. The closest Venus can get to Earth is when it passes through the least curved region of Earth's orbit. This occurs when the Earth is close to perihelion, its closest approach to the Sun. The orbits of both the planets are mathematically linked and repeat almost perfectly at every five conjunctions, which last for around eight years. This indicates that the distance between Earth and Venus at each conjunction will be roughly the same after five conjunctions. With all this information under our belt, we know that there is no one answer to the question of how far away is Venus, but we do know its closest, farthest, and average distance from us. As we mentioned above, all planets orbit in an ellipse rather than a circle, but Venus has the most circular orbit. The average distance between the planet and the Sun is 67 million miles or 108 million kilometers. Venus is closest to Earth at its inferior conjunction, where it is just 25 million miles or 40 million kilometers distant at its closest perihelion. Because of changes in Earth's orbit throughout time, the minimum distance between our two planets has risen. Since 1623, Venus has been no closer to Earth than 24.5 million miles or 39.5 million kilometers. Venus will not approach within 24.8 million miles or 40 million kilometers of Earth for more than 60,000 years after the year 5683. Venus's closest and farthest approaches occur only every 19 months or so. Between times, its average distance from Earth is around 42.2 million miles or 68 million kilometers. This isn't the whole story, because the distance to Venus changes every day and fluctuates greatly over each orbit, but it's a good starting point. Venus is even closer to Earth than Mars. Scientists today think that Venus had habitable conditions a few billion years ago until our runaway greenhouse effect caused by volcanic activity and water loss from Venus's atmosphere. This process sentenced Venus to its current terrible landscape. Because of many reasons and mysteries like this, the Morning Star has been a prominent target for space missions. With the first space missions launched by Soviets and Americans in the early space race in the 1960s, both the countries sent various spacecraft to the hellish planet in the space race. Out of the 41 missions launched to Venus since the advent of the space era, 23, American and Soviet, have successfully traveled to Venus, counting all of those that flew past Venus without being dedicated to studying it. This success rate easily exceeds the success rate of missions to Mars. These spacecraft, which have been sent to Venus, can offer valuable insights on how much time it takes to reach it. The Venera 1 spacecraft by the Soviet Union was the first space probe to be launched towards Venus. The mission was launched on February 12, 1961, with the primary goal of reaching the planet. However, on February 17, scientists lost touch with the space probe. Because mission controllers did not have time to make a course correction that would have brought it closer to Venus, it is believed to have passed within 100,000 kilometers of the planet on May 19. That's a total of 97 days, or a little more than three months. NASA's Mariner 2 completed the first successful Venus flyby. This spacecraft was launched on August 8, 1962, and successfully completed a flyby on December 14, 1962. So the total time from launch to arrival at Venus is 110 days. The Pioneer Venus 1 mission was launched on May 20, 1978, 
and arrived at its destination in 198 days. ESA's Venus Express was the most recent spacecraft to visit Venus. It was launched on November 9, 2005 and traveled to Venus in 153 days. Why is there such a difference between the time taken by different spacecraft? Traveling to the planet in a spacecraft is not an easy task. It's not feasible to simply determine its location, point a spacecraft at it, and click the huge launch button. Instead, we must account for the movement of the planets as they orbit the Sun. We must also avoid our own gravitational pull at the beginning of our voyage and enter Venus's at the finish. It all comes down to several factors like the route, fuel efficiency, and others. Let's take a look at some of these. All of this is like a physics ballet. Often the best path to our destination is not the most direct, which adds to the time it takes to get there. It all boils down to launch velocity and trajectory. The Earth and Venus are both in orbits around the Sun. In order to reach the morning star, you must travel in a transfer orbit between Earth's orbit and Venus's orbit, catching up with Venus and ideally entering orbit. To accomplish the journey with a smaller, less costly rocket, you must take a longer, more time-consuming route. Another important factor to consider is the sort of engine driving the spacecraft, whether it is fuel efficient or not. And a third factor to consider is that slowing down takes a long time. So if a spacecraft is only going to fly by, it must slow down. But if it's going to orbit, its voyage to Venus will take longer. So because of this, it is very clear that there is no one answer for how long it would take to reach Venus. It all depends on a variety of factors, but based on the history of missions to Jupiter, the shortest time a spacecraft took was 109 days, and the longest was 198 days. On an average, missions to Jupiter take between 120 to 135 days. But what about humans going to Venus? Terraforming it has been an important topic for discussion lately. If Venus was once habitable, could it be made habitable again? To be honest, the process would be really hard because of the planet's hellish atmosphere, but certain ways can allow the terraforming of Venus. But that's a topic for another video. Today we want to talk about whether a human mission to Venus would be possible. Humans have never made the trip, but someday we can expect at least a flyby mission, as landing on the planet itself would be very unpleasant. The only probes that landed safely on Venus and sent back images of its surface area were Venera 9 and Venera 10, which lasted for 53 minutes and 65 minutes respectively. The surface temperature of Venus can reach up to 950 degrees Fahrenheit, not to mention thousands of volcanoes and a planet like an oven. Simply surviving on Venus's surface would necessitate technology that could endure tremendous heat and corrosion from sulfuric acid in the atmosphere not to mention the strain on the human body. Humanity will send several unmanned expeditions to the planet. Even so, machines can only retrieve so much data and information. We'll arrive at a moment in time when our next move will be to set foot on the planet. There are a few basic properties of Venus that fascinate astronomers all around the world. The fact that there is a layer of atmosphere in which humanity may exist and that the planet's rocky surface is similar to Earth's. We can just imagine what a human landing on Venus would look like. On an average, with the best of our spacecrafts, we can even shorten the journey to 60 to 80 days in the future with better engines and propulsion systems. But only time will tell. How long will it take us to go to Mars? And can we decrease that time with technological advancements? The answer is a big yes. How? When it comes to Mars, though, there's a reason why we haven't explored the Red Planet and why only a few landers have made the trip. There are many problems lying in the deep depths of space that make a voyage to Mars oh so tough. The journey to Mars has been the stuff of science fiction for generations, but now it is quickly becoming a reality. There are many challenges that need to be overcome before a crewed mission to Mars can be launched, but the two major players, NASA and SpaceX, are up to the task. They have been working together intimately on missions to the International Space Station, but they have competing ideas of what a crewed Mars mission would look like. NASA's focus is on safety and caution, while SpaceX is more innovative and willing to take risks. 
However, both organizations recognize the need for cooperation in order to make a journey to Mars a success. By pooling their resources and expertise, NASA and SpaceX might be able to overcome any challenges standing in the way of the journey to Mars. In order to determine how long it will take to reach Mars, we must first know the distance between the two planets. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun and the second closest to Earth. Venus is the closest. But the distance between Earth and Mars is constantly changing as they travel around the Sun. In theory, the closest that Earth and Mars would approach each other would be when Mars is at its closest point to the Sun, perihelion, and Earth is at its farthest, aphelion. This would put the planets only 33.9 million miles or 54.6 million kilometers apart. However, this has never happened in recorded history. The closest recorded approach of the two planets occurred in 2003, when they were only 34.8 million miles or 56 million kilometers apart. As such, the journey to Mars would likely take anywhere from 33 to 34 million miles. How long would it take to reach Mars if you were traveling at the speed of light? It would take 3.03 minutes to reach Mars at its closest point of approach to Earth, and 22.4 minutes to reach Mars at its farthest point from Earth. The average distance between Earth and Mars is 65.4 million kilometers, so it would take 12.5 minutes to reach Mars traveling at the speed of light in a vacuum. These numbers are based on the assumption that you are starting from Earth and traveling in a straight line towards Mars. In reality, the journey would be much longer because you would need to account for the curvature of the Earth, the rotation of the Earth, and the orbit of Mars around the Sun. However, even with these factors taken into account, it would still be possible to reach Mars within an hour if you were traveling at the speed of light. But traveling at the speed of light is not a realistic approach for us, at least according to our current technologies. But what about the fastest spacecrafts that humanity has ever built? NASA's New Horizons spacecraft is one of the fastest ever spacecraft to travel to the outer solar system, capable of reaching speeds of around 36,000 miles per hour or 58,000 kilometers per hour. If you could use such a spacecraft to travel to Mars, you would reach the planet in just 162 days or 3,888 hours at its average distance from Earth. However, at its farthest point from us, Mars would be 289 days. 6,944 hours away. But things get even better when Mars is at its closest possible approach to Earth, as you would then be able to reach the Red Planet in just 39 days or 942 hours. But last year in 2021, even this record was broken by NASA's Parker Solar, which was shattering its own speed records as it gets closer to the Sun. On November 21, 2021, the Parker Solar probe attained a peak speed of 101 miles or 163 kilometers per second during its 10th close flyby of our star, equating to 364,621 miles per hour or 586,000 kilometers per hour. According to a NASA statement, when the Parker Solar Probe approaches the solar surface in December of 2024, the spacecraft's speed will exceed 430,000 miles per hour. With the speed of the Parker Solar Probe, it would take us just 93 hours to reach Mars at its closest approach and just 29 days on its farthest distance from the Earth. That's a big thing for humanity. The difficulty with the previous estimates we talked about is that they use a straight line to calculate the distance between the two planets. Traveling through the furthest passage between Earth and Mars would require a travel directly through the Sun, whereas spacecraft must move in orbit around the star of the solar system. Although this is not a problem at the closest approach, another issue arises when the planets are on the same side of the Sun. The figures also assume that the two planets maintain a constant distance. That is, if a probe is launched from Earth while the two planets are at their closest approach, Mars will stay the same distance away for the duration of the probe's 39-day journey. How long it takes to reach Mars depends on a number of factors including the planet's alignment in their orbits and the propulsion system used. According to NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, the ideal lineup for a launch to Mars would get you to the planet in nine months. However, due to the positioning of the planets and other factors, it is usually closer to two years. Engineers must calculate the ideal orbits for sending a spacecraft from Earth to Mars. 
their numbers factor in not only distance, but also fuel efficiency. Like throwing a dart at a moving target, they must calculate where the planet will be when the spacecraft arrives, not where it is when it leaves Earth. Spaceships must also decelerate to enter orbit around a new planet to avoid overshooting it. How long it takes to reach Mars depends on where in their orbits the two planets lie when a mission is launched, and also on the technological developments of propulsion systems. Mars moves a significant distance around its orbit in the nine months it takes to reach there, roughly three-eighths of the way around the Sun. You must prepare ahead of time to ensure that Mars is where you need it to be by the time you reach the distance of Mars's orbit. In practice, this implies that you can only begin your journey after Earth and Mars are correctly aligned. This happens once every 26 months. That is, every 26 months, there is just one launch window. The home and transfer technique with launch windows every 26 months is the quickest and most efficient way we know for reaching Mars, and it takes around 9 months to accomplish. A round trip would take about 21 months to complete. We would need to spend thousands of dollars a second to just get to the red planet and would have to sacrifice a large amount of payload based upon our current technology and not to mention the kind of impact such a long trip would have upon human psychology. So if we are able to achieve speeds like the Parker Solar Probe, a journey to Mars would be much less than it is right now. But what is humanity doing right now to try to get to Mars? Elon Musk, the CEO of SpaceX and one of the first pioneers to go to Mars, is creating the Starship to transport humans to Mars. SpaceX is presently developing their Raptor engines, which are recognized for producing a tremendous level of thrust. They want to replace it with the Raptor 2.0, which will be a significant upgrade in Raptor engines. But what distinguishes SpaceX is its quick reusability, which no other firm has done as of yet. The Raptor 2 engine, which is presently in development, is an important component of SpaceX's future. It has a massive amount of power that has been nurtured in ways never previously seen with science and reusability. The Raptor engine is something that space engineers have long desired but have never been able to achieve. It will save money, energy, and allow enormous spacecraft like the Starship to bypass our atmosphere and sail directly for Mars. How long would it take us to go to Jupiter? Jupiter is one of the most important planets in our solar system. With giant anti-cyclonic storms and a magnetosphere so powerful that it defies comprehension. Jupiter is an intriguing planet. Many people would prefer to go to Saturn, obviously, because of its beautiful rings. But Jupiter, too, won't disappoint you. There are many reasons to go to Jupiter, like its icy moons, which we will discuss later on in the video. But if you were to escape Earth for some reason, a cost-benefit observation would show that Jupiter is a more viable option. So why would we want to travel to Jupiter? One of the most compelling reasons to visit Jupiter would be its moons. Even though Jupiter is a gas giant, it has 80 rocky moons. It's almost like a mini-solar system of its own. Jupiter's moons like Europa, Ganymede, Callisto might contain vast reserves of liquid water underneath their icy shells and can be the best place to look for life in our solar system. So if we decide to go to Jupiter, how much distance would we need to cover? The journey to Jupiter is going to be a long one. Earth and Jupiter are like sprinters sprinting on a clay track under the scorching sun. Because they circle around the sun at different speeds, the distance between them varies all the time. The distance between them is approximately 365 million miles at their closest point and 600 million miles at their furthest point. Just to give you an idea, 600 million miles is more than 24,000 times the circumference of the Earth. And to get a better idea of how far Jupiter is, it would take us approximately 800 years if we tried to travel to Jupiter at 70 miles per hour, which is the normal speed for our cars. The two celestial bodies are approximately 483 million miles apart on average. Keeping these things in mind, Scientists must weigh the benefits of burning more fuel versus the significant cost outlay and time required to reach the goal. The time it takes to travel to a distant planet is determined not only by technical advances in propulsion technologies, but also by how all of the planets are aligned. Since we are talking about going to Jupiter, 
What about spacecrafts that have already been to Jupiter? There have been spacecraft in the past that have actually been to Jupiter. In the 1970s, four NASA spacecrafts, Pioneer 10 and 11 and Voyager 1 and 2, were launched. All four of them took a direct route to the gas giant. Even though all of these traveled to Jupiter, none of them stayed around. They used Jupiter's gravity assist, which flung them out towards the outer solar system. But in the past, there have been only two spacecraft which actually stuck around, Galileo and Juno. Both missions followed a more indirect route to Jupiter, relying on the gravitational pull of the inner planets to accelerate through the asteroid belt and into Jupiter's orbit. Taking the long route required less fuel, which is required to slow down sufficiently to establish a stable orbit. So how long did these trips take? NASA's Pioneer 10 was the first spacecraft to reach Jupiter. It traveled the shortest route possible, taking only 640 days, just under two years. Despite this, it barely arrived within 130,000 kilometers of Jupiter. When a spacecraft just intends to observe the planet superficially, it takes faster paths. Pioneer 10 probe took a few photographs of Jupiter before continuing its journey towards the outer solar system. In a similar fashion, Pioneer 11 and Voyagers 1 and 2 took roughly around 600 days, but were able to reach much closer to Jupiter than Pioneer 10, getting within 22,000 kilometers of the gas giant. The Galileo mission, which was launched by NASA with the specific goal of researching Jupiter and its moons, was the first space mission to spend several years orbiting the planet. To stay close to the planet, a spacecraft must travel slowly and follow a more roundabout route in order to enter Jupiter's orbit and conduct its inquiry. A too fast spaceship would simply fly past the planet without entering its orbit. The Galileo mission took 2,242 days, nearly six years to reach Jupiter, but it did it at precisely the appropriate velocity. Galileo, the first spacecraft to spend several years in Jupiter's orbit, used a Vega Venus Earth Gravity Assist course. The spaceship had one near contact with Venus, then two rounds about Earth before being hurled off like a disk towards our solar system's main planet. The fastest any spacecraft traveled to Jupiter was the New Horizons probe, which traveled around 45,000 miles per hour, reaching the giant planet in only about 405 days. On its approach to Pluto and other minor planets, this space probe had an unusual flyby. It took advantage of Jupiter's tremendous gravity to increase its speed and optimize its path towards the dwarf planet Pluto. The gravity assist from Jupiter helped New Horizons increase the probe's velocity by approximately 8,700 miles per hour. This helped in truncating its trip to our solar system's beloved dwarf planet by three years. If we talk about sending humans to Jupiter, there might be quite a few other things to keep in mind, and the missions would also take a bit longer than the spacecraft. The farthest humans have been in outer space is the moon. We haven't been back to the moon also for the last 50 years, and are finally returning now thanks to the Artemis missions. According to NASA, the shortest, most fuel-efficient path to Mars would take 9 months one way and 21 months round trip. If we generalize the methods used to compute this path, a similar one-way trip to Jupiter would take almost six years. NASA also predicts that a four-person crew would require 8,000 pounds of food every year, implying that a four-person mission to Jupiter would require 48,000 pounds of food simply to get there, and significantly more to return. In addition, all of the life support and research equipment would have to be sent into orbit from Earth. On top of this, we would also need to reach Jupiter safely. Astronauts would face a lot of challenges. One of the biggest one being radiation. Aside from the continual bombardment of radiation from the sun, which is unprotected by our magnetosphere, space travelers will have to shield themselves against galactic cosmic rays, which can cause genetic damage and cancer. Astronauts will also face various psychological issues while spending lots of time in space. Long-term space flight can cause anxiety, which might exacerbate interactions with other crew members. Isolation from family and friends, along with a routine work schedule, exacerbates these symptoms. Even though astronauts are trained for this, they are trained on Earth. Once you go outside of our home planet and see the blue marble floating in space, it changes your perspective. 
Thanks to NASA's new generation suits and the upcoming Artemis missions, these challenges will be perfected and improved upon in the coming years. While traveling to Jupiter, there is also the route which scientists have to keep in mind. A spacecraft can travel a straight path, like the pioneers and voyagers did, or a longer, more roundabout path, like Galileo or Juno. A lengthier trip would need them passing close to a planet's orbit. This is why their alignment with respect to each other is of critical importance. The planet's gravitational pull lures a spacecraft inside when traveling towards it and then slingshots it on its way around and back out. The spacecraft has to rely on the planet's orbital energy to achieve this. The loss of energy is so tiny that even though the planet loses some amount of its energy, the retardation in motion is negligible. At last, there is the question of which is a more efficient method to reach Jupiter. While you may get to Jupiter faster and in less time by burning more fuel, there is a more fuel-efficient method that will save you a lot of money and other valuable resources. Furthermore, money isn't the only barrier in this situation. Satellites moving at high speeds also struggle to slow down to the proper velocity and settle into a celestial body's orbit. However, spacecraft, like any typical trip through a low-lit planetarium giving you a tour of the solar system, are built to speed by planets with the goal of only glancing at the planet and taking a few shots before flying off to explore the unknown ahead. This is known as a flyby. Jupiter is one of the most active and interesting planets in our solar system. Jupiter's moons, which have enormous seas behind thick ice shells, may just provide the right environment for life to develop and are among the top contenders for life outside of Earth in our solar system. Fortunately, we have two major space missions planned to visit Jupiter's moons. The first is NASA's Europa Clipper, which was created expressly to examine Europa, one of Jupiter's 80 moons. It's scheduled to launch in 2024 and is expected to reach Jupiter's orbit by 2031. As previously explained, in order to remain in Jupiter's orbit, the spaceship must follow a long meandering course with reduced velocity, rather than just whizzing past it. Another project, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer mission, is planned by the European Space Agency to launch in 2022 and reach Jupiter's orbit by 2029. In brief, an extremely fast spaceship like New Horizons can reach Jupiter in a little over a year. But if the goal of the space mission is to only fly past Jupiter, it would take roughly 550 to 650 days on average. To examine the planet and its moons by entering Jupiter's orbit, a spacecraft must be slow enough to reach Jupiter's orbit at precisely the appropriate speed, allowing it to be caught by the gas giant. The gas giant has many things to offer us and will be a valuable resource to understand about our solar system. How long would it take to go to Saturn? Saturn is one of the most beautiful planets in our solar system. Its rings are one of the most differentiating features. It's often seen as a hazy yellow planet in the night sky and feels so close when we observe it with binoculars or a telescope. But in reality, it is much farther away. Saturn is one of the most beautiful and intriguing planets in the solar system. It has piqued the interest of scientists for decades, if not millennia. According to Laplace's theory of cosmogony, it depicts an early stage in the development of the solar system. However, this is not the only reason that Saturn fascinates people all around the world. Scientists were also hunting for solutions to other problems, such as how Saturn acquired its rings. Why are the circles different colors? What are the source of its faint self-luminescence? Is there a greater number of moons orbiting Saturn? And then there are moons of Saturn which are even more intriguing to scientists. Courtesy of the Cassini mission, which we will come to shortly, scientists were able to witness phenomena that had never been seen before. Titan, a moon of Saturn, is also a contender for possibly harboring life. Even other moons of Saturn, like Enceladus, make the exploration of Saturn even more exciting. Owing to all these reasons and a possibility of a human base on one of Saturn's moons, exploration of Saturn might one day become humanity's major goal, like exploration of Mars. In order to go to Saturn, we first need to understand how far away Saturn really is. Would it take a long-haul trip for us to get to the ring planet? What challenges will a human voyage face? 
let's not get ahead of ourselves and start with the very basic. The distance of Saturn from us. Saturn, like our planet Earth, has an elliptical path around the Sun. Its orbit is tilted 2.4 degrees relative to Earth's orbital planet. As a result, finding the distance between the planets is no easy feat. Just like getting to a place on Earth might take varying lengths of time depending on the path you take, getting to Saturn can take different amounts of time depending on which route you choose. As both planets travel through space, the distance between them changes all the time. They are around 746 million miles or 1.2 billion kilometers away when they are the closest or eight times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. They are a little over a billion miles or 1.7 billion kilometers apart at their most distant, when they are on the opposite sides of the Sun from one another, or 11 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Because the planets move into ellipses, distance between them may vary significantly at a certain point of time. According to research, the closest distance between Earth and Saturn was 1.201 billion kilometers on December 21, 1914. Cassini and other spacecraft cannot be launched straight to Saturn. They are too hefty and insufficiently strong to slow down when necessary. Instead, Cassini was heading towards Venus and passed by it twice, once by Earth and once by Jupiter. These flybys provided Cassini with enough power to accelerate, utilizing the gravitational attraction of each planet. Saturn travels through space at more than 21,000 miles per hour and takes 29.5 Earth years to complete one circle around the Sun. Earth passes Saturn in its spin a little under once a year, causing Saturn to seem to travel backwards in the night sky as our planet zips past it. When it comes to traveling to Saturn, there have been many previous spacecraft that have been sent to the planet. All took different amounts of time to reach Saturn depending on the route they took. We have already talked about the distance of the planet from us. Using these numbers, we can't figure out how long it would take to get to the gas giant. And when we talk about getting to a planet, it's always nice to talk about probes and missions that have already been sent to Saturn. A total of four missions have covered the distance to the ring planet. Three of them were flyby missions, whereas Cassini-Huygens was a dedicated mission to Saturn in orbit from 2004 to 2017. When spacecrafts are sent, scientists have to decide on which route to take. We can get to a planet faster and in less time by burning more fuel. There can be fuel-efficient methods that will save a lot of money. Furthermore, money isn't the only barrier in this situation. Satellites moving at high speeds also struggle to slow down to the proper velocity and settle into a celestial body's orbit. However, spacecraft, like any typical trip through a lonely planetarium giving you a tour of the solar system, are built to speed by planets with the goal of only glancing at the planet and taking a few shots before flying off to explore the unknown ahead. This is known as a flyby. The three flyby missions were by Pioneer 11, the Voyagers, and the New Horizons mission. Pioneer 11 was launched in April of 1973 and traveled nearly 70 years to reach Saturn, arriving in 1979, taking about six and a half years to reach Saturn. Voyager 1 was launched in 1977, and it took three years and two months to arrive at Saturn in 1980. Voyager 2 was launched a month before Voyager 1, but it did not arrive at Saturn until August of 1981 and took four years. The Cassini-Huygens spacecraft was the spacecraft that took the longest to reach Saturn. It was launched in 1997 and arrived at Saturn seven years later in 2004 by utilizing the gravitational pulls of neighboring planets. The New Horizons probe was the quickest to reach Saturn and only took two years and four months to reach it. But why is there such a difference between the time taken by these spacecraft? There are many factors that influence the time taken to reach a planet in our solar system. As we mentioned above, scientists have to decide on the route and method to take while launching a space probe, and there are other factors too. The first major deciding factor is whether the spacecraft is launched directly towards Saturn or is it sent towards another celestial object of the solar system and has to only use Saturn's gravitational potential energy to slingshot itself. Before reaching Saturn, several spacecraft are launched towards other celestial objects. Another important factor to consider is the sort of engine driving the spacecraft, whether it is fuel efficient or not. And a third factor to consider 
is that slowing down takes a long time. So if a spacecraft is only going to fly by, it must slow down. But if it's going to orbit, its voyage to Saturn will take longer. This is where the definition of flyby we explained earlier becomes important while understanding the various routes to Saturn. With such considerations in mind, let's talk about these previous missions to the gas giant. Before reaching Saturn, Pioneer 11 and Cassini utilized the gravitational pull of many planets. Other planet flybys added years to their journey. Voyagers 1 and 2 moved far faster through the solar system, making their first sightings around Saturn. The New Horizons spacecraft has numerous notable advantages over the other stated missions. The primary differences are that it has the most sophisticated engine available and was launched on a single trajectory past Saturn on its approach to Pluto. It is vital to realize that in space, you do not travel in a straight path. The majority of time spent traveling is spent slowing down. If you do not slow down, you'll fly beyond Saturn into deep space because Saturn's gravitational attraction will not be able to bring you in. But that was the time taken by the space probe to reach Saturn. What about sending humans to Saturn? Could we shorten the journey? If we talk about sending humans to Saturn, there might be quite a few other things to keep in mind, and the missions would also take a bit longer than the spacecraft. There are many factors to be taken into account, number one being the mass traveling to Saturn. Robotic spacecraft are quite heavy, and adding humans, along with food and water to survive, may treble the weight of the spaceship. It implies you need double the power to launch safely. NASA also predicts that a four-person crew would require 12,000 pounds of food every year, implying that a four-person mission to Saturn would require approximately 72,000 pounds of food simply to get there, and significantly more to return. In addition, all of the life support and research equipment would have to be sent into orbit from Earth. Taking all of this into account, it would take humans at least eight years to reach Saturn. But you also have to think about the trip back. All of the spacecraft that have been launched have leveraged Jupiter's gravitational force to their advantage. When you get to Saturn, you may have to wait a long time for Jupiter to be in the proper position to provide power to the spacecraft. On top of this, we also need to reach Saturn safely. Astronauts would confront several difficulties. One of the most serious is radiation. Aside from the constant assault of radiation from the Sun, which is unprotected by our magnetosphere, space travelers must protect themselves against galactic cosmic rays, which can cause genetic damage and cancer. Astronauts will encounter a variety of psychological challenges when spending extended periods of time in space. Long-term spaceflight can generate anxiety, which can make relationships with other crew members more difficult. Isolation from family and friends, as well as a regular job schedule, aggravates these symptoms. Even though astronauts are trained for this, their training takes place on Earth. When you leave our home planet and witness the blue marble floating in space, your viewpoint alters. Thanks to NASA's new generation suits and the upcoming Artemis missions, these challenges will be perfected and improved upon in the coming years. As we talked about in this video, there is no straightforward answer to how long it will take to get to Saturn. Even with New Horizons smashing records and crossing the trip in under two years, scientists plan to improve on the speed and time taken with stronger engines and more efficient flight patterns. In the future, the time taken to reach Saturn might be shortened by a lot and interstellar travel might be as smooth as taking a vacation abroad. We never know, especially with the rapidly evolving technology. The Long Journey Ahead to Uranus Uranus, seventh planet in the solar system in order of distance from the Sun, third in diameter and fourth in mass. Average distance from the Sun, 2.871 billion kilometers. Orbital period, 84 years. Equatorial diameter, 51,100 kilometers, exactly four times that of Earth. Mass of 14.6 times that of Earth. Rotational period, 17.25 hours. Minimum temperature, minus 226 degrees Celsius. 27 satellites detected so far. A hostile and violent world. Already flown over by one of our probes many years ago. A world full of mysteries, and we are about to return to it. 
Above us, hidden in darkness, the blue giants Uranus and Neptune are claiming our attention. Much larger than Earth, than Mars, than Venus, yet so distant as to be invisible to the naked eye. We encountered them only once when Voyager 2 flew over them in 1986 and 1989, then passed on until they were lost in interstellar space. Numerous other probes since then have since visited all the other planets in our system, but the blue giants have not. They have been kept on the sidelines, even though we have long known that in them lies the key to understanding how our solar system, and especially the solar systems of other stars, came into being. Now, however, there seems to be a desire to return to Uranus, and that is a good thing. Countless, in fact, are the mysteries surrounding the seventh planet in order of distance from the Sun. Uranus is characterized by a rotation around its axis unique in the solar system, an atmosphere agitated by winds at extreme speeds, and an extremely complex magnetic field, all phenomena whose origins are not well understood. It is also unclear in what part of the solar system it was formed, whether it ever exchanged positions with Neptune in the system's turbulent early stages of evolution, nor what its exact composition is and how extensive its rock and ice core is. While it is suspected that some of its major satellites, Ariel and Miranda, which show signs of geological activity, may harbor oceans beneath their surfaces. If we tell you this, it is for a very specific reason. But let us first do a little history, just to get a better understanding. From the beginning of time until the evening of March 13, 1781, human beings knew of only five planets, those visible to the naked eye and now bearing the names Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Although it is also visible to the naked eye, like the other five planets known since antiquity, it was not recognized as such and considered a star until the 18th century because of its low brightness and particularly slow orbit, and was identified as something other than a star only on March 13, 1781 by William Herschel. Curiosity about his discovery is that it came completely unexpected. Planets visible to the naked eye up to Saturn had been known for millennia, and no one suspected the existence of other planets until Herschel's discovery who noticed that a particular low luminous star seemed to be moving. From then on, no one was sure of the real number of planets in our solar system. That was until between 10 and 11 o'clock at night on that March 13th, the Anglo-German astronomer William Herschel spotted a small blue-green disk in his telescope. Following it and noticing day after day that it moved across the sky, Herschel was thus the first human being to reveal that new invisible worlds orbited the Sun, or at least so the encyclopedias say. But was Herschel really the first to see Uranus? No, other astronomers in previous decades had seen it, but all had mistaken it for a star without having the patience to observe whether or not it had its own motion and moved on. Instead, Herschel was the first to identify in that fuzzy little star a moving object but did he immediately realize that it was a planet? No again. At first, he thought it was a comet, like the ones his sister Caroline discovered. And it took long periods of observations to get enough data to construct its orbit and to confirm that after millennia, the solar system had been enriched by another component. Like Earth, Uranus and Neptune are blue worlds. Neptune, on whose globe of marine color run white clouds, would also seem to the casual eye to be a clone of our planet. The blue of these planets, however, is not that of an ocean, but is the color of methane inside an icy atmosphere of hydrogen and helium at 220 degrees below zero, the coldest places in the solar system. Their strangely terrestrial hue, so different from the orange-red seething of Jupiter and Saturn, tells us that while they are two giant balls of gas, they are actually quite different from their larger cousins. Like Jupiter and Saturn, in fact, Uranus's atmosphere is full of hydrogen and helium, but with abundant presences of methane, ammonia, water, and hydrogen sulfide. Methane gas absorbs light in the red part of the spectrum, giving Uranus its blue-green hue. If you flew down through the layers of the atmosphere, the surrounding clouds would become denser and denser, colder and colder, 
bluer and bluer as the gases absorb more of the visible spectrum. And beneath the atmosphere might be found the answer to another of Uranus's great enigmas. Its unruly magnetic field is tilted 60 degrees from its axis of rotation, much stronger at one pole than the other, and shifted a few thousand kilometers from the center. Some astronomers believe the warped field may be the result of vast oceans of ionic liquids hidden beneath greenish clouds, filled with water, ammonia, or even liquefied diamond. The two blue giants have their own distinct personalities. When Voyager 2 flew over Uranus, its photos amazed astronomers, not because of what they showed, but because of what was missing. No bands, storms, spots, or clouds, just a homogeneous pale turquoise sphere. Only by altering the contrast of the images could very thin clouds be discerned. Today we know that in fact Uranus is not so calm. Thanks to infrared observations and later telescopes have noted that storms have arisen, but it remains the most serene giant among the planets known to us. On Neptune, however, no apparent calm. It blows the strongest winds in the solar system, 1700 kilometers per hour, three times the strongest wind ever recorded on Earth. Storms and bands and clouds are clearly visible, and all this turbulence keeps Neptune bright blue. In fact, Uranus is faded because of a permanent photochemical smog, which on Neptune cannot accumulate due to the stirring of the atmosphere. But what is the reason for this difference? Well, apparently the reason lies in the fact that Uranus is the planet that releases the least internal energy in the entire solar system. That heat that burns at the center of the planets, a relic of their formation. Uranus either does not transmit its heat or it has lost it and both options involve more questions than the answer. There is one possible solution, and that is that the interior of Uranus was disrupted by a giant impact. This would also explain one of the planet's most bizarre features. The axis of Uranus is tilted relative to its orbit by 98 degrees. It's basically lying down, like an inverted spinning top rolling on a table. This causes Uranus's poles at the solstices to look alternately straight towards the sun, and are thus the places with the longest known days, 42 years of sun followed by 42 years of night. The most immediate explanation is that Uranus was knocked down like a skittle by another celestial body as big as or bigger than Earth. In fact, today some speculate that both Uranus and Neptune were struck in their infancy by planetary-sized bodies, Uranus by a smear while Neptune in full. If so, it would be confirmation that the entire solar system was sculpted at its origin by immense cataclysms. Which ones? Today we know that the planets we know are unlikely to have formed in the orbits in which we still find them. This is told to us by the moon we have in the sky, most likely born from the remains of the crash of a planet the size of Mars with the primordial Earth. This is told to us by the fact that 3.8 billion years ago, young but now formed planets suffered an immense asteroid barrage, the so-called Late Heavy Bombardment. Computer models also tell us that billions of years ago, the giant planets performed a complex gravitational dance before arriving at their present orbits, hurling asteroids around like gravel kicked by a child. According to some of these models, during the formation of the solar system, Neptune was closer to the Sun than Uranus, and all the planets were still much closer to our star than they are now. The only way to understand what really happened is to see whether the blue giants have retained traces of their past history, for example to understand whether they formed where they are now or in warmer parts of the solar system. But it doesn't end there. Uranus and Neptune are surrounded by a large number of moons, also among the most exceptional and mysterious in the solar system as well as thin rings. We associate the word moon with the idea of a dead, grey body like our own. But the major moons of Uranus and Neptune appear to have been active. The five major moons of Uranus, Miranda, Ariel, Umbriel, Titania, and Oberon are bodies of rock and ice between 500 and 1500 kilometers in diameter that in the few grainy images sent back by Voyager 2 
often show signs of active geological phenomena and a young surface, capable of sculpting valleys and escarpments like Miranda's Verona Roots, the highest abyss in the entire solar system. A place where one can launch oneself off a 20-kilometer high vertical cliff and fall with exasperating slowness for 12 minutes before hitting bottom. What really happens, however, on those moons, we do not know. The moons of Uranus tell us that, as opposed to the hot geology of the terrestrial planets made of lava and rocks, there is also a cold but no less interesting geology drawn by ices and oceans of water, methane and ammonia instead of mantles of molten rock. All features have always been considered interesting, though not intriguing enough to merit special attention, until astronomers began studying planets around other stars and discovered that ice giants like Uranus and Neptune were everywhere. In short, there are plenty of reasons to visit the Blue Giants again, so much so that the US National Academy of Sciences recently issued a report urging NASA to plan as soon as possible to send a probe to Uranus. And that means that in all likelihood, the next high-profile mission will be the one that finally brings a probe into orbit around our home planet's most mysterious and most underrated planet. A mission that already has a name. It will in fact be called Uranus Orbiter and Probe, and it will aim to put a satellite into orbit around Uranus, which will observe in detail the planet's characteristics for several years while also launching a probe into its dense atmosphere. Of the proposed missions, Uranus was chosen because over the next 10 years, there is no possibility of a useful trajectory for sending a probe to Neptune. In the case of Uranus, on the other hand, there would be two possible windows, in June of 2031 and April 2032, both with the possibility of exploiting Jupiter as a gravitational slingshot for a journey of about 13 years. To reach the goal, the mission would have to be approved and development work begun by 2024. Other launch windows between 2032 and 2038 would require trajectories to the inner planets in search of other gravitational assists, and the trip would take more than 15 years. That leaves NASA a decade to design the probe and raise the $4 billion needed to build it. We're not talking about tomorrow. We will have to wait more than 20 years before we receive images and data from such a distant world. By that time, we should have landed on Mars and put permanent bases on the moon. It will be an era of exciting achievements. Let's keep our fingers crossed then, and let's all look forward to those happy days in the future. How long would it take us to go to Neptune? Did you know that with our technology, we have only been able to go to Neptune one time in all of history. Yeah, believe it or not, Neptune is so far away that even our fastest spacecraft would take more than a decade to get there. Also, without a group of astronauts set out to travel to the last planet in the solar system, they would not have enough fuel to return to Earth. But why is it difficult to reach the planet Neptune? How long would it take us to reach that planet with modern technology and why have we only been there once? Stay with us to answer all of those questions. Have we only gone once? Although it sounds hard to believe, the ice giant Neptune has only been visited by a single spacecraft in all of human history. And that spacecraft was the Voyager 2 probe, which passed close to Neptune's orbit in 1989. The Voyager 2 probe was part of the Voyager mission, which consisted of two space exploration probes, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, whose main objective was to study the outer planets, about which, until then, very little was known. One of the most compelling reasons for these spaceships to be designed is because on those dates, a significant event would occur that would not be repeated for more than a century. That event was a planetary alignment occurring every 176 years between Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The idea was that the Voyager exploration probes would take advantage of this unique planetary alignment to achieve speeds that could not be achieved with any fuel, using something that we have already talked about on this channel, the gravity assist. The only way to travel without fuel. Gravity assist is a space maneuver in which a ship uses a planet's gravity to change its speed and direction. Used in missions such as Voyager, it saves fuel and accelerates spaceships to speeds 
that they would never reach with conventional fuel to reach their objectives in less time. Gravity assist works like this. When a ship approaches a planet, it falls into the gravitational well generated by the planet's mass, causing it to gain speed and accelerate. If the ship doesn't change course, it will eventually fall towards the planet, but if it has thrusters that allow it to stay far enough from the planet, it will pick up speed and continue on its new trajectory. This technique allows spacecraft to explore multiple destinations in a single mission and reach greater distances in less time, but it has a downside. The disadvantage is that it only works if there are planets in your path, so you must take advantage of the moments in which they are aligned, and this does not always happen. If the Voyager ships were able to get so far, it was because they took advantage of a particular planetary alignment in which the forecast giant planets would be very close to each other, thus taking advantage of the gravity of the four planets. The spaceships were able to acquire the necessary speed to leave the solar system. The Voyager 1 mission took advantage of this alignment in its close flyby of Jupiter in 1979. Voyager 2, on the other hand, used a series of planetary gravity assists to pass Jupiter 1979, Saturn 1981, Uranus 1986, and finally reach Neptune in 1989. Thanks to this, the Voyager 2 probe became the first artifact created by the human race to reach the last planet in the solar system. Voyager 2 Voyage Voyager 2 was launched in 1977 and undertook an epic journey through the outer solar system. It used gravity assistance from Jupiter and Saturn during its journey to head towards more distant planets. In August 1989, after more than a decade of journey, Voyager 2 approached Neptune, becoming the first and only spacecraft to explore this planet up close. During its flyby of Neptune, Voyager 2 captured stunning images of the planet, its rings, and its moons. It discovered features like the Great Dark Spot, a vortex similar to Jupiter's Great Red Spot. It also observed swift gusts of wind in Neptune's upper atmosphere, exceeding 2,000 kilometers per hour. Voyager 2's flyby of Neptune provided valuable information about this remote gas giant and its system contributing significantly to our understanding of the outer planets and beyond. However, it must be remembered that Voyager 2 did not stay on Neptune but continued to the stars. If we wanted Voyager 2 to remain in orbit of Neptune, we would have to consider the braking time, the time it would take for the spacecraft to slow down to land in Neptune's orbit without shooting off into space. How's that? Isn't it enough to slam on the brakes like a car would? No. In space, things move very fast. Planets, comets, spaceships, everything. For a spacecraft to stay in orbit, a planet needs to have the same orbital velocity as that planet. Orbital Velocity To better explain this, imagine a car race. In car races, all the cars go at extremely high speeds. And although each car moves at different speeds, they all go so fast that if one of the drivers were to brake suddenly, at the moment of pressing the brake pedal, it would not stay in the place where it braked, but would advance several tens of meters until it braked completely. The same thing happens in the case of spaceships. When they leave Earth, they must reach very high speeds to escape the gravity of our planet, and each time they pass through a planet to take advantage of gravitational assistance, they acquire more and more speed. All the planets in the solar system orbit the Sun at different speeds. Neptune has an orbital speed of 3.38 miles per second. This means that if we wanted to place a ship orbiting Neptune, it would have to reach that speed since if it had a slower speed, it would never reach the planet in its journey around the Sun. And if it did, once the planet's force of gravity catches it, it will pull it until the spaceship crashes into the planet because it does not have enough speed to overcome the force of gravity. Conversely, if a spacecraft moved much faster than Neptune's orbital speed, its speed would send it flying off the planet. The only way to land on the planet is by acquiring an orbital velocity similar to and exceeding the escape velocity. And this is where the big problem lies. When the Voyager 2 probe used gravity assist to increase its speed while passing close to the gas giant planets, it ended up reaching a speed of 9.6313 miles per second. That is, it was three times faster than the orbital speed of Neptune. 
To be placed in the orbit of Neptune, the ship would have to perform a braking process with thrusters that slowed down to a third. The Voyager probes did not have the objective of landing in the orbit of any planet, so this maneuver was impossible to carry out. But if a human crewed mission of astronauts wanted to land in the orbit of Neptune, how would they do the braking process? The only way to slow down to land on Neptune is with propulsion engines, and a human crewed spacecraft is much larger than a space exploration probe, meaning they would need a lot more fuel. Braking is not so easy in space. Although it seems like a simple process, stopping a spaceship that is going so fast is not an easy task. In fact, it is something that has never been done in the history of space exploration. We've seen spacecraft accelerate upon entering the atmosphere of planets like Mars or Earth. Still, we have never slowed down a ship going faster than 9.6313 miles per second and placed it in orbit around a planet. A spacecraft the size of Voyager 2 would need an amount of fuel equivalent to more than 10 times its weight to carry out the braking process, which would take between 1 and 2 months. Yes, just as you heard, in a car race when braking, these continue to advance a few meters. In space, the ships continue to advance several thousand kilometers after starting to brake. The reason again is speed. To reach Neptune, the Voyager probe had to reach a very high speed, but consequently the braking process to stay on Neptune would be very slow. Now, in the case of a human crewed spacecraft with four astronauts, this would be at least 20 times bigger and heavier than the Voyager probe. That is, it would need 20 times more fuel to brake and 20 times more time or even more to stop a space exploration probe than a human crewed spacecraft with human beings. Let's imagine that in 120 years, when the planetary alignment of the four gas planets happens again, we launch the first human crewed spaceship bound for Neptune, with four brave astronauts on board who will replicate the same journey that Voyager 2 took in the 1980s, passing through Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and finally Neptune. Suppose those calculations are correct and take advantage of all the gravitational assists. In theory, they should reach Neptune in a period very similar to that of Voyager 2, that is, 12 years. But it may take them a little longer since a manned spacecraft is much larger and heavier than a scanning probe. Also, astronauts cannot be subjected to massive g-forces, so they would not be able to take advantage of gravity assist as Voyager 2 did. If the spacecraft in which the astronauts travel is 20 times heavier than Voyager 2, it's likely that instead of taking 12 years, the trip will take 22 to 24 years. But even reducing the risks of being subjected to the g-forces by gravity assists, the astronauts will not be able to stay on that planet unless they break, and this is where the difficulty begins. When breaking a human crewed spacecraft, passengers submit to the inertial force they experience from being in a deceleration process. The human body cannot withstand great forces, so the spacecraft breaking process of carrying astronauts to Neptune will have to be very slow. How slow? Possibly it takes them between two and four years. As you just heard, it takes two to four years just to slow down, meaning that the complete journey from Earth to Neptune should take between 24 and 28 years. And that using all available resources such as propulsion rockets, special planetary alignment, gravitational assists, etc. Isn't it incredible that even taking advantage of all these resources available to humanity, it takes us almost three decades to reach the last planet in the solar system? In addition, we are talking about a trip with no return, since the fuel we are considering for this video will be used only for the braking process. Once the astronauts arrive at Neptune, they will not have the fuel to return to Earth. If we wanted to calculate a spaceship with fuel to return to Earth, the spaceship would have to be 1,000 times bigger. Let's not forget that more than 90% of spacecraft is just fuel, so the fuel needed to go from Neptune to Earth would be overwhelming, much more than all the rockets humanity launched in history have ever used. And you. Do you think we will be able to send humans to Neptune, or will we have to wait for space travel technology to change? Let us know your opinion in the comments.